my plan for tonight had been to talk about uh, you don't need to change it don't change it had been the, to talk about the um ag reserves role in the revolutionary war and i i this past weekend had a um a little kind of similar type presentation with the local uh daughters of the american revolution group and that was kind of an appropriate topic for that forum and, uh, and it was a good presentation, but one of the things that I noticed as I was thinking about talking to you all was most of the houses that came up um, in that topic were houses that I've covered a bunch of times with you all. And just to be honest with you, I, for the sake of you, you know, not boring you, I decided to kind of change course this afternoon as I was driving home from work and thinking about what would actually be a little bit more interesting um, to talk about tonight. Um, and, and by the way, the cliff notes for the, the Revolutionary War thing is there was no battles here in the Revolutionary War. There was no leaders. There was no forts. There was really no significant troop movement. Um, what we, what we kind of saw was some veterans who, after the war, returned to the area to begin building their homes, many of which, again, I've shown you before, um, and, and kind of settled and, and started, you know, lives here. So there's a connection to the war in that regard but really there was no there, there's not a, a great connection between pools and the revolutionary war like there is for the civil war um so that's kind of the the summary of that discussion i'm going to consider that presentation complete however if you want the slides for that i'm happy to send them to Dottie to send out to the group ag reserve property search um what i decided i wanted to talk about tonight was really just kind of going through some a, a lot of pictures that I've come across over the last year or so that I think are really, really interesting to get a sense of kind of where we've been and where we are today and what's changed and maybe what's not actually so different. Um, I, I recently came across kind of a, a little treasure trove of like 10 postcards of downtown, well, downtown Poolsville from around 1909, 1910. And they're really interesting pictures. And so what I thought I'd do is start by showing you some of those um, and then showing how they correspond to the landscape today. And then I would um, also bring up some pictures of uh, homes in the area that um, were captured in the 30s through the historic uh, architecture and building survey project. Um, and I'll talk a little about that later. Um, and show those homes to you, see if you all know which ones they are just from looking at those old pics and then show how they compare to what they look like today. Okay, so a lot of this is gonna be pretty visual. Um, and same with these slides. I'm If you're interested in these pictures or whatever, more than happy to send these out um, afterwards if you wanna take a closer look. So I wanted to start with this picture. So I came across this just recently, and I think it's probably my favorite old picture of Poolsville that I've ever seen. Um, and it's not one that I had seen previously. This postcard is from, supposedly it's from 1909. However, the bank building that we now know is the old town hall, um, right there in the center of town was was built in 1910. Right. So there's something there's something off with the dates here. Um, either way, this is very early 1900s. Um, obviously, you're looking at what we now consider the old town hall straight ahead. Um, to the right, you see kind of this this row of buildings. And those buildings, for the most part, are completely gone. Most of them were wiped out in the 1920s and 1930s fires. Um, and, and so now, you know, I'll show you in a second, the, the landscape looks a bit different, right? We um, now see a lot of kind of open space there in those areas where there previously had been kind of these rows of homes, but there's a lot of similarities. I mean, we still have same, you know, the, the sidewalk scape, the, you know, the town hall obviously is still there. Uh, the cars have certainly changed, right? So there's, while we've we've changed a lot in the you know 110 years or so since this initial picture was taken, um, it's quite easy to see kind of the the streetscape. You know, I, I don't think that this is like a hard comparison to make, right? Um, 
And one of the things that I wanted to point out that I think is just kind of personally fascinating is in this old picture here, you see that, that house in red, um, in the red box. That home I recently talked about in the monocle, it was here until 1985. So it was this home. And this was initially built in the 1830s by Dr. Stephen Newton Chiswell. And Chiswell fam family owned it for, for many years. And in fact, if, if you saw the article, you know that um, a, an individual who had been enslaved by the Chiswell family spoke of his account first working at Annington down uh, close to, to White's Ferry, which was owned by the Chiswell family um, prior to the Civil War. And because the overseer at the Annington plantation was uh, apparently very cruel to him, he was sent up here to the Chiswell's other home, which is this building, to, to work. Um, and he has some really interesting accounts of, you know, literally witnessing uh, warfare on the streets of Poolsville during the Civil War from this home, right? He's, he talks about actually watching a Confederate soldier get shot by a Union soldier um, from this position. So it's, it's an interesting, you know, linkage um, to the Civil War. If you look at the details of this, I mean, I think it looks, it, it, the construction of it looks very similar to other homes from around the 1830s and 1840s in the center of town. So think of like the Jameson real estate building, um, the locals cafe home, um, the, the Blue Hearth building, which is now privately owned as of the last few weeks. Um, so it's a very similar construction, but unfortunately taken down in 1985. I mean, it had come into pretty bad shape but you can see on the right, um, I mean, I'm sure everybody recognizes that view right there in the center of town, right next to um, the old town hall there is that, that big open space. Well, that is the, that house is what used to be there. And that was in the late 1800s known as the Merchant's Hotel. So you might see references to a Merchant's Hotel um, occasionally when history is talked about, and it was this home. Um, after it was a hotel, it was owned by the Kohlhaas family for a number of years. Um, and then obviously at some point kind of fell into a state of disrepair and there was a decision to, to take it down, to build out more space for this parking area. So th this picture is um, again, right there in the center of town to the right, obviously we have the, you know, then the bank building. Um, and so right to your immediate left here would be kind of the, the locals cafe home and the John Poole house. And this is that, that looking down that Coxon's lane, right? So remember in, you know, early Poolsville, Fisher and Coxon's lane kind of split right there at the, that, um, the bank building. And this would have gone down towards Whalen Commons as we, as we know it today. Um, now this road, if you've been back there, it kind of ends uh, a little bit down the road, but it's, but it's interesting to kind of see it um, in kind of its more earlier form there. Um, and then obviously when we compare it to today, um, you know, I guess it looks fairly similar from this angle. Um, obviously we know it ends there. So I don't know if anybody recognizes this, but this would be, if you're coming into town, and you had uh, Elizabeth's Delight neighborhood to your right. And this is the, I believe it's the Methodist church there. Um, and also to the very, very far left is the, um, I think it was like the, the rectory home um, at the time. It's still there. Um, unfortunately, I think there are plans to actually take that home down because it's in pretty bad shape. Um, but it's, it's cool to see this church in its earlier form um, because it actually has changed a bit, right? If we look at the way that view looks today, I mean, you can see the difference in, I don't, I don't maybe somebody here knows, but when this Methodist church was clearly renovated, um, the tower changed. And then it's also missing kind of those really large, uh, I would assume stained glass windows there on that front, although they are still on the other side facing the street. Um, so again, another example of change, but not really. Um, certainly our roads are paved now and here in 1910 or so, it's, it's very much a dirt road. You can see tracks from maybe cars at that point, um, but kind of an interesting view coming into town um, 
compared to what we have today. So this one, I'm, this picture, I like I'm open for interpretation on. Uh, I'm not completely sure what this is showing. My strong suspicion is it's this. I think it's the corner of the blue hearth house. Um, I think that because of the way the road is kind of curving outwards, which is what it does as opposed to the other place that I thought this could have been would be um, the locals cafe house, but that old Cox and road doesn't curve like that. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I, I think that what we're looking at is kind of that very front corner of the blue hearth house, which was, you know, the home owned by uh, the pools built around in the 1830s, um, I believe. And, um, and I would note too, if you haven't noticed that the, that home has been purchased now, um, there is a family moving in there and um, I've been in touch with them. They're super interested in the history and everything, which is awesome. Um, so it's from what I can tell, it's in really good hands um, moving forward, which is, which is exciting. Cause I was, I was concerned it would potentially not be. And then this would be, you know, clearly a shot taken from basically if you were sitting on the front steps of the old town hall and looking into the center of town. Um, it's a pretty like it's a striking picture because most of the homes there on the left are completely gone. However, if you look far, far off into the distance, you can actually see uh, the the Dr. Thomas Pool House, the Blue Hearth House. And it's kind of that last one in a row. And you can kind of tell by the white dormers at the very, very top of the house that are still very much there. So that, that house has really not changed much at all since 1870 when it had an addition. Um, so it's really easy to spot. And then right next to it is the Frederick Pool House, which is also still there. It's kind of the, the frame shop and it's got a bunch of different offices in there now. So, so those two parts are certainly kind of original to the location. Um, but the rest of this is, is largely all gone. Um, and in those days, this was not a four-way stop. It was a three-way stop. So that kind of, that piece of the landscape has also changed. Yeah, just to kind of see that comparison here. I mean, it's, you know, it, that's, a, that's a pretty different look <laughs> from what it looked like in the 1910s. Okay. So those were kind of the pool pictures I just thought were fun. What I really wanted to do was kind of show you some old houses and actually talk about some of these structures. So this home, I don't know if anybody recognizes it because this, this is a house that's way out of the way. Um, and it's not one that you really would ever see while driving. Um, it is known as Stony Castle. It was built by the uh, Chiswell family. And um, this is where, or I'm sorry, the White family. Um, and this is where an individual by the name of Elijah White was born. So White's Ferry is named after Elijah White. He was born here in Stony Castle. Uh, home was built in, they think in the 1830s, although it's not completely clear. Uh, you can see made of stone, hence Stony Castle. And uh, Elijah White, at, even before the Civil War started, he had gone out to uh, seminary school um, in, I believe, Kentucky and ended up sticking around for um, the, what was called Bloody Kansas, which was kind of a, a small border war um, between uh, abolitionists and um, individuals fighting essentially to preserve slavery in those new, newer states. Uh, he was fighting against the abolitionists. And once that was over and he returned, he and, and the war and the Civil War began, um, he promptly crossed the river, started up the 35th Virginia Cavalry and took command of that. So he, um, you know, played in terms of young men from Poolsville fighting in the Civil War, his name is probably at the top of the list of uh, that comes up, uh, rose to the rank of Colonel. And after the war, he, um, he largely remained in Loudoun County. So he really, he really didn't come back to Poolsville after, after the war. He, um, he was a successful banker. He, I think he was in politics for a bit. He might've been a sheriff. 
lived on a big old farm right across the river. You could literally look across the river from his house back into uh, Poolsville. Um, but just kind of a, an interesting background with this with this home. And, you know, it's interesting, you can see this shot on the left is from the 1930s. And, and what we have happening here, and I've, I've probably mentioned this before in prior talks, but during the, uh, the Great Depression, the Works Progress Administration, in an effort to employ mostly young men, basically started this thing called the Historic uh, Architecture and Building Survey. And what they did was they just sent guys out all over the country to take pictures of old homes and kind of record them in the archives. In some cases, they took a bunch of pictures of one home. In other cases, they only took one or two. Um, you know, by all accounts, these guys were kind of just sent out to these locations with rough addresses. And so as a result, it's kind of a, when you look at the homes that they took pictures of in this area, I'm always wondering like, why did they take one of this one and not this other house? So it feels a little bit random. Um, but luckily when they came through these parts, they actually got to a bunch of old homes, many of which are still standing. And so we have these really great old pictures. Um, and in most cases, these are the oldest pictures that we have that still exist of these homes that I'm aware of, right? And so you can see there in the 1930s and then on the right, um, largely unchanged aside from, you know, this decision by, by somebody to put kind of this neoclassical front uh, piece on, on the front porch. Um, so, so very much an interesting home, an important piece of, of Ag Resort history given, um, you know, its links to the White family and to Elijah White specifically. So I don't know if anybody recognizes this one. Um, this is another one that's a little bit hard to see from the road, although you can. This is down on River Road, right across, basically right across the street from the Seneca Schoolhouse. There is a really, really long driveway that goes way back. And now, actually now is a good time of year to be able to see it because the trees along the driveway aren't really in bloom yet. But um, way back there, you can see this kind of grand kind of almost block or square looking yellow house and this is known as Monte Video. Uh, this was built for the Peter family in the 1820s and the Peters were incredibly wealthy um, largely from the Georgetown area. Uh, a lot of personal connections to the George Washington uh, family and um, they built this estate um, I think partly as a, as a country home, but also they were involved with the marble, or excuse me, the Seneca sandstone quarry, um, which is basically down the, you know, across the street and down the hill along the Potomac. Um, and they, so they had a stake in that early on. Um, so they, they built this home and you can see here in the 1930s, it had actually fallen into pretty rough shape. Um, and shortly, I, I believe in 19. 50s or 60s, the Kiplinger family actually purchased this home, did a, a massive uh, restoration, you know, project on it, um, and really, you know, I, it was in bad shape. So I would say they saved it. And now it's um, not only is it in clearly in good shape, and this picture is from like the 80s or 90s, so it's quite old itself, but it's very good shape, but it's also incredibly um, restored in a very original manner. So when you, I, I've walked into this home and it really, this is one of those places where you really, really feel like you are stepping back into time when you walk in the front door. Um, notice that that wing on the left there um, is, well, in the, in the black and white photo, that old kind of wooden wing structure is gone, right? So that was removed as part of this renovation and they built this more modern wing on the left-hand side of the home, um, which is where kind of the kitchen is. And a lot of, you know, some of the, the modern, more modern aspects of the home are located, whereas in the center part of the house, it very much feels like you're stepping back into the, the 1830s. Also a really, really interesting family cemetery on this plot of land um, with individuals dating back to when this house was originally built. Okay, so this is probably my favorite picture uh, on this presentation. 
this is it's a it's a really odd angle what we are looking at straight ahead that that larger house back there um, is Aix la chapelle Aix la chapelle was built by the brewer family in 1813. this is outs on um it's on, on kind of where jerusalem meets 28 so kind of towards bellsville and uh dr brewer who built the home in 1813 was a surgeon he actually was apparently a surgeon during the war of 1812 in some capacity which apparently delayed him completing his home here in, um, at aix la chapelle uh returned here finished the home and ran his little doctor family practice out of this small little home you see on the left so that is or it was initially the doctor's office. Still very much there, still really well preserved. And in fact, what's really interesting about this place is if you go into the upper level, you can see kind of that little window up top. There's a, there's a loft up there and there's still actually graffiti on the walls in this place thought to be from the patients who in some cases were sick enough to where they had to spend the night in, in the office so that Dr. Brewer could check on them early the next morning. Um, it's it, it, it passed through a number of hands through the 1800s and and the 1900s um, you can see here in the 30s clearly uh, <laughs> that it was being used more for for livestock um, and got into you know another another home that was in some pretty rough shape um, until about five years ago when the current owners purchased it and this is really like a, a pretty massive um, I don't know, I guess you would call this like a glow up for sure, because um, today the home looks like that. And I mean, it's been, it's another example of a home that's been restored really well, with a lot of taste, um, but still, you know, maintains a lot of its, its original features. Some things have changed. So if you look at the main home there, you can see kind of these wings that come off on both sides. Those wings are not present in the picture on the left, right? They were not original home. Those wings were added in the 1950s. Um, and then the other thing that you might notice is that the main home here in the attic has these three dormer windows. And in the 1930s picture, that's not there, right? So those, those were certainly added later. Um, so there, there's been some changes here to, to modernize the home, but um, it's a really, it's just kind of a cool angle shot and um and actually uh this these two pictures will be side by side in the montgomery magazine this next edition so if you see it there this is where it came from um the picture on the right was taken by the homeowners not me and the picture on the left is obviously from that that Habs survey back in the 30s uh, i don't know if people recognize this house Sometimes I'll show it to people and they won't know what this is offhand. And then once I explain to them where it is, they know exactly what it is. This house is known as the 1785 house. It's right in this kind of center of town, right? Right across from the gas station there. You're pumping gas, you're kind of staring at this place. This is a shot from the 1930s. This is another example of a place that, I mean, it's um, almost eerie that it's, it has not changed, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's virtually identical. Um, 17, my favorite thing about this house is that it's known as the 1785 house and it was built in 1832 and nobody knows why. Uh, so it's like such a, uh, a weird thing. Um, and in fact, on the, on the other side, kind of facing West Willer there, if you, if you look up on that house, there's a really cool fan window. But if you look above that, it actually has 1785 written on the side of it. Um, again, this house was built in the 1830s, so it's still very old, but it's not that old. Uh, there is there's a belief that there was a log structure behind this home built in 1785, and that's how the date kind of got assigned to this location. Um, but nobody nobody seems to have any confirmation on that and um and i think i was listening to randy to talk about this home a few weeks ago and i think he mentioned that it had been a uh, a headquarters during the civil war um for for one of the generals that passed through here which which would make sense if you think about you know a relatively limited amount of buildings here that would make sense for for a general to occupy and certainly i mean this road sitting in front of 
1785 House saw its share of troop movements moving down towards White's Ferry, right? So this was a pretty high traffic area at that time. Um, but just kind of a cool, interesting structure. And especially those small little, you know, two over two windows there on the right side are really, really unique. I've not seen them anywhere else in the Agri Circuit Court. I'm sure you all recognize this. So this is the, the Jameson House or the, or the Jameson Real Estate um, Building. And I, I, I was surprised to learn that this this structure is like one of the oldest in town. I mean, it, it's a it's a very old structure. Um, I think 1830s, maybe even 1820s. And what's kind of funny about this picture here in the 1930s is if you count the front doors, um, there's there's four. Or if you count the chimneys, there's three. But when we look at it today, there's you know three front doors and two chimneys, right? Um, if you take a closer look though, that, that far kind of section of the, the structure appears to be wooden siding. So I don't know if it was added after it was initially built, but my understanding is that that part of it actually burned down at some point, along with that little kind of shack looking place next to it, which was apparently a little house where, um, men used to gather to play cards. Uh, at night, which is kind of interesting just to think about what those conversations would have looked like. Um, but a really good, you know, another example of a place that, I mean, when you look at it from this picture, it, it, for the most part, this place has not changed, right? I mean, it's in, in structure very much intact, um, kind of the exact same distance off the road, uh, really a mainstay of, of the center of town. This is this is a home that's you've you've passed by this a million times, whether or not you knew it. So this is out on um, Route 28, near where 28 meets Buck Lodge Road. This place is known as Greenwood. It just sold, I want to say, about two years ago. Um, really, I mean, really, really pretty home. Um, it was built in the 1840s. And it was built by Nicholas Brewer. So I showed you Aix la Chapelle, which was built by Dr. Brewer. Nicholas was his son, who was also a, a doctor. Um, Nicholas, and this is kind of a sad story, but his first wife that he married shortly after um, having this um, home built died at the age of 26, completely unexpectedly. Um, then he was remarried. He ended up having four kids none of his four children lived past 40 years of age. Uh, so my assumption would be that this home saw a whole lot of grief, a whole lot of very difficult times. Um, but a, a, a good example of, and I think it's kind of like interesting architecturally, but a good example of one that um, really has only improved in age. Um, a lot of the, the main features are still there. And, and this is one that really has been taken care of um, pretty much from its, its beginning. Um, so when this was for sale, like two years ago, it was for, it was out of my price range, we'll say that. And um, I showed up to, you know, just to check it out to see if I wanted to buy it. And, and the real estate agent who I knew like looked at me and he's like, go ahead just look around. I was like, yeah, I'm not a serious buyer, but um, it was great to be able to go in there and walk around and kind of explore it when it was just wide open. Um, really, really nice house. And um, I, in a future presentation, I'll, I'll pull up and show you the, the interior pics. Um, it's, it's been modernized, but, but in a really tasteful manner. So here's Inverness. This is my, um, my love affair with this home that I've never actually seen up close. Uh, Inverness built in um, somewhere between 1818 and 1825, um, again, from the White family, uh, built by Benjamin White. And you can see here in the 30s, you know, it's kind of got this very federal style with these two wings. It's really similar to Annington. If you've seen that by Waits Ferry, it's kind of similar to East Oaks in some ways. And as I've mentioned before, um, it's actually believed that it's the same 
I don't want to say the same builder because the builder of this of these homes were undoubtedly enslaved persons, right? Um, but the same individual who probably came in to kind of oversee the design and the work of this home, um, just just given the, the way it's built and also the time frame um, and similarities to the others. And I, I somebody sent me this picture from a family file recently. This is again from somewhere around 1920. Um, when it, I believe it was still in, in the white family's um, possession at that time, but it's just kind of a, it's just, it's just a cool shot of, of people kind of um, sitting there on the front porch. looks like they're reading the newspaper and just kind of hanging out. Um, I don't know why the shutters are closed on the left. That's kind of interesting, but, um, but yeah, so can it kind of neat picture. And you can see, I mean, the picture on the left from the 1930s picture on the right from I think the seventies or eighties, but it, it looks, it's the same today, right? So aside from that, that large kind of front porch that's stretched across the building, um, it's largely just kind of that, that small entryway. Um, but another example of, you know, a home here in the Ag Reserve that not, has not only been kind of maintained, but, but largely kind of kept the landscape upon which it was built um, intact from, from the beginning, which is, which is special because that's not common <laughs> around, you know, the rest of the state of Maryland or, or, you know, the East Coast. I really like this picture. And this one, I don't know, maybe many of you know exactly what this is. As you look at it, it's really obvious once you know what it is. Um, but so, and I didn't realize how much disrepair had kind of befallen, you know, this, the CNO Canal um, in the 1930s. Um, but this is a Monoxy aqueduct and, um, you know, you can, you can see, I mean, it's very much, uh, the same place, but, um, but certainly it's been, it's been cleaned up and maintained. And if you've been to the aqueduct recently in the last few years, I mean, it's a, it's a really great place to spend time, to walk, to bring kids, to do whatever. Um, and it's just interesting to me to think that in the thirties, it really wasn't, I don't think that they were thinking of places like this as just sites of recreation, right? It was just kind of the old canal that had served us a purpose for a while and was just kind of gone and, and being overgrown until somebody came in to preserve it. And then Chiswell's inheritance. So this is, this is the home that Stephen Newton Chiswell came to um, in the very late 1800s with his son, Joseph. Built this home in a couple of different sections, but completed construction, um, I wanna say in the seven, late 1790s. Uh, you can see kind of, uh, again, a good example of, of federal style architecture here. Um, and when we look at the back of the home today, uh, you know, the back porch is gone. Actually, if you look at the brick closely, you can kind of see the outline of where the, the roof line for that back porch had been. Um, but for the most part, this, this place has not changed very much. Um, I would note that, so the attic here is one of the most interesting attic spaces I've ever been in in an old home. It actually feels like you are, it, they built it like they would build a barn. So if you go into the attic, it's got kind of these weird, beam support structures that look very similar to a barn. So it's a, it's a weird thing. You go up like three different rungs of stairs and then you get into the attic and you feel like you're standing in a barn up there, but just in a, like a really, really cool space. And just this home is just always such a, an interesting place given, you know, its ties to the Chiswell family. And I think to me, as I've said to you all before, really kind of a marker of, um, the, the beginning of construction of really kind of larger estates here in the Ag Reserve, right? This is really one of, especially in this part of the Ag Reserve, this was kind of that first grand home that really was, was constructed, right? A few years after John Poole House, but obviously the John Poole House is largely, it's, it's really cool in its own right, but it's, it's basically a log structure, right? This is kind of a state that's being built here. All right, so Hopefully my plan to kind of go off the cuff and show pictures works, but let's see, are there, um, are there any questions or anything that people want to talk about? Um, 
Jack, you have a very good eye. Yes, uh, it is reversed. And to be honest with you, I was kicking myself after I went out there to take that before and after picture because I didn't realize it until I got home and was comparing it. But yeah, so I took it so that the 1930s picture, oops, sorry, um, would have been taken from actually the, like if you go to Monoxy Aqueduct and you park there, this is the far side of it looking back towards that. Right. So good eye though. Yeah. Kenny, I have a question. Um, the Kaliva building where the Kaliva store is. Yeah. Is that one of the original buildings that you showed in the, the main streetscape or is that that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure. And somebody on here might, and if you do, please chime in. Um, I know that, that that building obviously is an old one and it's been there for a really long time. What I, what I don't know is whether or not um, that structure is one of those original ones or if it was like built on top of an old one. Um, for example, the what we now know as the Old Town Hall, that's actually the third building on that site but using the same foundation all three times, right? So building comes down, they build a new one on literally the same footings. Um, so I don't know if that's what's taken place there or if that place has been there since the beginning. Certainly the front of it is kind of changed in composition a bit, right. um, but um, but yeah, good, good question to kind of think about and dig into, but perhaps somebody knows. Um, Christina asked, how does Poolsville architecture and growth compare to neighboring towns? Um, that's a, you know, that's a good question. It's a good thing to kind of take a look at. I mean, Poolsville was, if, if we go back to like the civil war, Poolsville was, I think, don't quote me on this. I want to say that Poolsville was like the second most populated town in Montgomery County behind Rockville which is not saying much, right? It had like 200 and something people. Um, but these were like everybody, it was very rural. And um, so it's, I think, different from a lot of towns in that sense. If you, if you look at Rockville, you know, Rockville very much has, and, and I mean, it's more of a city, right? But Rockville has that very grown up section. But if you actually like walk back into the old part of Rockville, it's interesting because there are a lot of really interesting old, old houses kind of off the beaten path. Um, and you can almost see kind of how that that location expanded and grew outwards. Um, so, you know, so I'm not sure how it necessarily compares. I would say, and one of the things that I'm I'm like working on right now is showing how how the town itself has kind of expanded largely through um, construction in the '70s, beginning in the '70s, right? If we go back and look at you know, an overview of Poolsville in the 1950s, and then you do that again in 1980, it becomes a very different place, right? A lot of new neighborhoods come, um, but a lot, of, a lot of that center portion of town really hasn't changed because anybody wanted to tear stuff down necessarily as much as it's been either stuff that was poor construction that just kind of was not sustainable over a long period of time, or again, um, those fires through the 20s and 30s, I want to say there are two or three pretty significant ones that took down um, a lot of buildings um, where, you know, we still have gaps, I think, in the center of town, maybe uh, as a result of that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's been, there, there's been plenty of growth here um, and, and plenty of old structures that we've lost um, but all, but within the town proper, there are still quite a few old homes that um, that are with us um, and, and kind of survives a lot of that change. Um, yeah, Mueller asking about the fires. So I, I don't know a ton about that. I'm, I'm curious about it. I'm you know willing to look into it. Um, I know Randy knows a lot about that. That might be something interesting for him for him to actually talk about. I know there's been articles in years past about that in the monocle. Um, but I can I can certainly look into that. Um, hey, Kenny. Yeah. This is this is Jack. I just pulled out my history of Poolsville book. Mm -hmm. so, so the first big fire was 1923, and then again in 1931. Okay. And then most recently in 1953. 
Wow. And, and the book actually lists, it looks like pretty much every residence or resident who had a, a, a building destroyed or damaged. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was like, those were pretty significant. There are a couple of old pictures showing kind of the like immediate after it might be actually be in that book, but like the immediate after uh, math of the fires and they're, they're not great quality pictures, but you can kind of tell like they were pretty destructive. Yeah. Um, it seems to me like a lot of the more kind of expensive structures that were built from brick or stone, like for example, the Jameson real estate building, um, probably survived it as a result of the way that they were built. Whereas some of those, you know, wooden structures that were a bit more uh, flimsy and less sustainable largely just kind of went with the fire. Um, Stan asked about the pool storehouse and how old that is. Um, that's a good question. I know that, I know that the, the home right next to the pool store um, is from 1855. I know that for a fact. Um, I, I, the pool store is not as old as that. I think it's closer to turn of the century. Uh, there was a mill on that site. Um, if you remember a few years ago when they were kind of renovating the pool store, they actually found a big kind of mill wheel when they were kind of digging there and did a big architect archeological study down there. Um, but I'm not, I don't know offhand how old the pool store is. I have another question, Kenny, and I don't know if you'll remember this or if anybody on, um, yeah. but I know when I first moved here in 1980, um, gosh, and I can't remember the group that used to do the haunted house right on the, uh, our main drag on 107. It was the best haunted house, but it was an old house, obviously abandoned. Yep. You know whose house that was? Um, it's in, I don't, it's in the Poolsville book. Um, and I, I can look that up. I know that it was, so for those wondering kind of where that was, there was, so I know there was, there was one that was located like, um, kind of in between the beer and wine store and the post office. Now it's like that brick, like AT&T yeah, building, yeah. but that's where it was. Right. And, and I know that it was, um, it was actually, it, it wasn't torn down. They actually gave it to the fire department to do like a, a practice fire um, to put it out there, which was actually a pretty common thing in the eighties that was happening a lot to old homes that were kind of in bad shape. Um, the fire departments would come in and train on them. Right. Um, and so that was what ended up kind of doing it in, but yeah, I was, so I'm, it's funny cause I have a couple of friends who are a couple years older than me who were you know dragged through that house when they were little and they still talk about it so clearly it was you know um scarring for them i i missed it just by being a few years too young um but um but yeah i've heard it was it was quite scary yeah bob chapman who's no longer with us used to play be the dead person in the coffin that would jump out when you came <laughs> to that room. yeah never forget it yeah but yeah, there's got to be somebody with some really cool pictures of that place somewhere in town. You know, it's in some basement or something just because so many people like I've heard people bring that house up frequently. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, interesting kind of background. And another another question is, do you know why the Brewer family, why the children died at such a young age? And um, I don't offhand, I don't. I could certainly I mean, that's probably pretty easy to figure out there. You know, one of the things that um, I'm always struck by when I look at like these family trees from, especially from the early 1800s, is the frequency of loss um, in those days was so prevalent. Um, and, you know, you, you look at the people who are buried out of monocacy and, you know, go to the find a grave website that Glenn, that Glenn Wallace runs and you look at their kids, they all had like eight to 10 children. But part of the reason for that was that like three or four of them would all, like, all you'll see a lot of dates of people buried there. And it's like born 1802, died 1803, right? Like really, really common. Um, and, you know, I think it was just largely disease. Um, I've been thinking about it a lot, actually, just over the last year with with COVID and thinking about kind of the you know, some of the, the emotional and mental effects that 
a virus like that going around has on a population and how kind of like scary it is because you can't see it and it's kind of out of your control. And I mean, that, that kind of feeling, I think was probably fairly prevalent in those days, right? I mean, it was more of just kind of the way things were. Um, but as a result, we just see a lot of loss from, um, from those types of ailments um, you know, a lot of mothers dying um, in childbirth, you know, fairly frequently. Um, you, you see a lot of times um, where a, a husband or wife will pass away and you can see like, you know, she died in March of 1862 and then the husband died in July of 1862, right? Which is normally some kind of signal of like, they probably had something that, or something was going around at that time. Um, the owners of Inverness are a good example of that. They've died within a couple of months of each other. Um, and I don't know the specific cause, but I would suspect that that's something to do with some kind of ailment that was going around. Uh, so there's just a lot of loss back in those days and people dealing with, um, I, I would imagine, a lot of grief back then. Hey, Kenny. Yeah. The um, haunted house, according to our good handy little history yep. book, it was called the Arthur Fletchell House, hmm. built, built for Arthur Poole and Lulu Fletchell in 1880. And as you said, it was burned by the fire department yeah. in uh, 1983. Okay, interesting. Pretty, oh. And a pretty, pretty cool picture of it too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's probably, that's where probably Fletchall Road is named after, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Interesting. Oh, and Jane said that the... Um, yeah, the store built in 1901. I thought, I thought it was kind of closer to turn of the century. And I know that it's funny because it is, you know, everybody calls it pool store, but I have heard um, All Nuts say to me, like, you know, it really should be called All Nuts store. <laughs> That's who <laughs> built it. <laughs> but. Um, I see one here. Did you mention the house where Colonel Edward Baker was laid out after the oh. Yeah, um, I, I didn't, I very, very quickly mentioned it, but I'll, um, I'll just show it since it's here. Um, a little bit hard to see, but if we look, if we look at this picture, so the, the home in being referred to is, is the Frederick Pool House, and that is the house, it's still there, it's next to um, the Blue Hearth House, it's kind of, it's, it's, um, it's kind of got that like grayish green stucco. It was like the frame shop and everything right across from, um, well, it's right next to Blue Hearth Building. If you look in this picture at the very far end, you see kind of those white dormer uh, windows at the very top of the Dr. Pool house, the Blue Hearth house. Right next to that, you can kind of make out like the front porch and then the, um, the kind of center arch gable on it. That's the Frederick Pool House. And so the story with that is, um, and I'm sure many of you heard it, but at the Battle of Balls Bluff, um, uh, Colonel Edward Baker, who was actually a sitting senator at the time, went across the river, took command of a unit, um, and was killed in battle. And my understanding is he's the only sitting senator to ever be killed in combat leading you know, troops. Um, and he was very close friends with Abraham Lincoln. Um, I, I've heard accounts that there's, you know, only, there was only like a few occasions where anybody ever saw Abraham Lincoln actually weep out of grief. And one of them was when his friend, um, Edward Baker, uh, was killed. Um, and so they brought his body, you know, is, this is obviously, this is a big deal, right? I mean, this is a Senator, um, he's killed in battle. So they brought him back and they, he laid in the front parlor um, for the first night at the Frederick Pool House right there in the center of town. And then he was brought onward to, to DC where I think, I think he might've laid in state at the Capitol. I'm not, I'm not completely sure of that, but um, the, the weird thing with him is he, he's, when you look at where is he actually buried, he's buried out in Monterey, California. <laughs> so he had a, um, he had like interesting connections to California. He, I think he was, my understanding, he was responsible for creating one of the first California units in the Civil War, even though they all came from Pennsylvania, but he wanted to show this kind of, this state being involved in the cause. Um, so yeah, so just kind of a, an interesting backstory with, with pools were much connected to the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln uh, again. 
Do we have any more questions? Dottie, I would like just to mention one thing before you close us out tonight, if there's no more questions. Um, if you haven't been our, on our website, um, we have posted Glenn Wallace, who um, I don't know his official title, but he does uh, uh, take care of or covers Monocacy Cemetery. He's with Montgomery County Cemetery Coalition. Kenny, I know you'll correct me. But not. No, I think I think you're. He's. I think he's the president of the board at Monocacy Cemetery. Okay. And then I'm not sure what he does for the county, but I know he's very much involved. So he he's done a couple programs, very interesting programs. Yeah. Uh, the first one was, um, you know, details about our local Monocacy Cemetery right there at 109 and 107. Um, but he's having a volunteer cleanup day on March 28th. Um, that's a Sunday, I believe. Um, and is looking for volunteers. We have it posted on our website, um, but you can always email him at monocacycemetery at gmail.com. Um, looking for volunteers. It's a great volunteer opportunity. All the decorations and everything need to be cleaned up before mowing starts on April 1st. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to remind people if you know, you want to get out and about, you'll have to wear a mask, there'll be social distancing, you might want to bring gloves, but it's a great opportunity to um, get out there and, and do something, be outside, bring your kids to help.